Good afternoon. This is Chuck Ridgeway, Automation Technology Manager here at Horner. And we're recording this live stream here uh, during the Christmas season. So I want to wish all of you out there a Merry Christmas. Today's topic, we think, is a good one. It's the first on a two-part series. And it covers Seascape Recipe Management. And joining me today, as he always does, Mr. Casey Gardner. How you doing today, Casey? Hey, not too bad. How's it going, Chuck? Merry Christmas to you and your family. You too. All right. Well, recipes is our topic today. And certainly our customers that are in the process industry, they really can take advantage of recipe functionality in Seascape. But uh, before the show, you and I were talking, and you were talking about a different application that I really hadn't thought of from a recipe standpoint, uh, where we were looking at recipes. You have one application that's kind of come up. It's been a, a nice, uh, fun word in the industrial industry is uh, OEE for uh, equipment efficiency. And uh, that's, that's one that, that's come up where in terms of part management and say you're wanting to track a number of different parts or, or things that are being produced, um, there's an easy way to um, load, save, or modify a number of different parameters you set for those type of systems using things like recipes as well. So it's kind of a nice application. Great application. Terrific. So Casey's going to be managing the chat today. If you have any questions, just chat those in. He'll get those answered right away, or we'll save them until the end. If you're watching this on replay, like a lot of you do, go ahead and get us your questions. Just do it through the comment section, and we'll get those answered in non-real time. Okay, let's go ahead and get started. Okay, recipe management. And again, this is a two-part series, and today it's part one. So here's what we're going to cover today. You know, what are recipes in Seascape? Need to give you a baseline there. We'll talk about Seascape's recipe tools, and that includes the recipe editor and the graphical object that's included with the recipe function. And then there's also a couple of ladder logic function blocks we'll review. We'll talk about the workflow. If you're going to incorporate recipes into your application, what's the workflow? What's the process of adding that feature to your machine? And then, of course, as we always try to do, we've got a good hands-on demonstration for you. All right, let's dive right in. Okay, so what are recipes in automation? Well, when we talk about recipes in general, one thing I read up on that I was, I guess I didn't know before, is that the word recipe has its origin in drug production or drug prescriptions back in the day. And of course, we all know it from its common use in cooking. But I did find a couple of applicable dictionary definitions as well. So one dictionary said that a recipe was a set of instructions for making or preparing something, including a list of ingredients. And another definition I liked was a recipe is a formula for or a means to a desired end. Now, Seascape's recipe tools are used to allow process parameter settings to be applied using a spreadsheet to allow the repeatable production of a variety of products. So just like Casey talked about in the opening, if you're managing a series of parts that are being manufactured on a machine and they have different parameters, then using a spreadsheet and specifically using the recipe function is a great way of managing that. Okay, so let's dive into those Seascape recipe tools, starting with the recipe editor. And the recipe editor is really kind of the main tool that Seascape uses for handling recipes. So effectively, it's what allows Seascape and the OCS at runtime to handle recipes as ingredients and products in rows and columns on a spreadsheet. You can think of every ingredient as a process variable. You know, the temperature set point for a particular part, water volume, pressure, whatever the case may be, a process variable. And then each product is the result of running your process with a unique combination of set points for each of the process variables that's being managed by the recipe function. And then the spreadsheet that we're talking about really is a CSV formatted file that resides on the micro SD card. So at runtime, the OCS is retrieving all these process parameter set points from that CSV file that's residing on the memory card in the OCS. Now, there are additional tools as well. And of course, we're going to demonstrate all of this here in a few minutes. But there is what's called a Seascape 
recipe object. And the recipe object can be configured for four different functions. The first function in which you can use the recipe object is as a view indicator. And what that allows you to do really is just indicate on the screen what the currently selected product recipe is. So if you're managing a dozen parts using the, the recipe function or even 200 parts, the one that's currently in use is going to be shown using the view function for the recipe object. Now the other three functions of which you can use the recipe object for are all buttons. Okay, and you don't have to use any of these, but they're all available to you. The first is a load button. What does a load button do? Well, when it's pressed by the operator, it allows the operator to select the product recipe that's to be loaded. And then what happens when he presses that button is a pop-up window appears with a list of all the different product recipes available. And then one of those can be selected by the user. And then those parameters, those ingredient settings, are all loaded into the process variables that are being managed by the recipe function. Similarly, there's an edit button that you can configure. Now when you press that, it allows the user to go ahead and modify the set point values for any of the editable parameters that they want to modify. Okay, so maybe you have a standard recipe for a particular part or a particular product that you're manufacturing. You want to tweak one of those parameters a bit. Let's say you've got a cure function on the machine, and when you normally are processing a particular part, you would cure for 75 minutes, and maybe you want to adjust that to 77 minutes or something. So you could use an edit button to go in and change a recipe parameter from 75 to 77, for instance. There's also a save button function. What does the save button function do? Well, in that scenario, let's say, just like you see on the graphic there, you have a list of all your ingredients or all your process parameters that are being managed by the recipe function. And let's say you've tweaked a couple of those process parameters while you're making the current part, and you'd like to save those away under one of the recipe products. The save button would allow you to do that. Once again, the operator would press the button to save the recipe, a pop-up window would appear, and they would select the particular product that needs to be saved using the current settings under the ingredient list. So those are the four different functions that are available using the graphical recipe object. Next we've got a couple of ladder logic function blocks that are available, and those are a load recipe function and a save recipe function. Well, why would you want to use these? Well, all the things we talked about with the graphical recipe object were all triggered by the operator. So if you were going to load a particular recipe with the things we've talked about so far, you'd require an operator to push a button to make that happen. Well, maybe you want that to happen automatically. Maybe you want the machine to automatically load a particular recipe based on the part that it's going to run next, and maybe it got that information from a SCADA package or something, or from an MRP system automatically. So in that scenario, instead of depending on an operator to press a button, you want the logic program to go ahead and load the recipe. And that's what the load recipe function block is good for. There's also a save recipe function block. So let's say you have a scenario where the OCS or your application program is automatically tweaking some of the parameters in the process and maybe you want those tweaked parameters to be saved back into the standard recipe. So to do that from logic as opposed to from the screen, you could take advantage of the save recipe function block. Okay, so a couple more tools you can use in your tool belt when you're dealing with recipes. All right, now let's go through the workflow for adding recipe functionality to your application. Now, recipes, just like, oh, let's say, some of the other features like data logging, for instance, are features that you're typically gonna add towards the end of your application development cycle. So you've generally got the machine working, you've got everything set up the way you want it, you've developed your variables, you've developed your logic, and now you wanna add recipe capability. Well, first of all, you need to make sure that any process variables that are impacted by recipes, uh, any of them that are going to be modified with the recipe function, you want to make sure those have already been created. 
Now, what I like to do next when it comes to setting up recipes in my applications is I like to start with a spreadsheet. So I'll typically fire up Excel or some other spreadsheet program and I'll actually set up my recipes starting with Excel, okay, where I use in the columns, that's where I'll add my ingredients and in the rows, that's where I'll add my products. And then once I've done that, then I typically export that as a CSV file so I'm ready for Seascape to import that information. Now, starting with a spreadsheet is absolutely not a requirement. You can start right from this step here if you'd choose. You can skip the spreadsheet step and just jump right into opening the recipe editor in Seascape. And that's available from the Seascape program menu. Now, the first time you go to the Seascape recipe editor, What's going to happen is Seascape is automatically going to prompt you to create a new recipe. It's going to ask you to name it. It's also going to ask you to assign a file name to that particular recipe. Because remember, at runtime, there is a CSV file that has to reside on the OCS's memory card in order for the recipe function to work properly. So you've got to name that file. And you're going to name it in an 8.3 format, You know, something like products.csv. And then you're going to go ahead and size that file. How many products, how many ingredients to come up with an overall size for that particular application. Next, you're going to go ahead and do what's called configuring a product variable. Now, when you're running the machine at any given time, typically you're going to have a specific product that's been selected and those recipe parameters are going to be loaded into the ingredient variables for that particular product. So it can be very helpful within Logic to be able to see what current product recipe is currently being executed. So that's where configuring a product variable that tells you that current recipe is very handy. And you have two choices. If you prefer that it's just some sort of numeric index, then you can assign a numeric variable to the product variable. If you'd prefer to actually have the exact name of the product embedded right in that variable name, then instead you can assign it as an ASCII variable type. And that ASCII variable is a byte type array of up to 32 characters or 32 bytes. So again, this is my preferred workflow. Keep in mind I started out by I started out by creating a spreadsheet that had my recipe information in it, and I exported that as a CSV file. Definitely an optional step. But when you do that, next, from the Seascape recipe editor, you're going to want to go ahead and import that spreadsheet, that CSV file, and then Seascape will automatically import as much data as possible from that file. And today, in Service Pack 5, the data that's being imported, a 9.9 .9 Service Pack 5, the data that's being imported are all the products and all the values for the different ingredients in the recipe. What is not imported is actually the ingredient names. That's not that big a deal because ultimately we have to click on every ingredient and configure it anyway to not only assign the name, but also to go ahead and tie it to a specific process variable in your program. So if it is a curing time or a curing temperature are two of the parameters, for instance, that are controlled by your recipes, then those are going to be a couple of the ingredients that are going to be included in that recipe. And those need to individually be tied to process variables. Now, if you choose to skip the CSV process, the CSV file import, then you still need to go ahead and manually name all your products and also complete that process of naming each ingredient and tying it to a variable. And then again, you do have the option of setting the initial values of your variables for the specific product. So for instance, if you have a specific product that needs a cure time of 75 minutes and a cure temperature of 400 degrees Fahrenheit, you could go ahead and set 75 and 400 as the values or the initial values for that particular recipe for that particular product. So that means you're starting out without just a bunch of zeros in all your process variables, you're starting out with real values that you want to start from. Okay, and then next you need to make sure that once you're done configuring the Seascape recipes, 
you need to make sure that that CSV file ends up on the micro SD card in the OCS. Now, you can allow Seascape to handle that for you by going to the Program and Download Options dialog and setting how Seascape chooses to download the CSV file. And you have three different settings that are available. You could set it so that that recipe file is always downloaded with every single Seascape download you perform. I probably wouldn't recommend that one. You can also choose for Seascape to prompt you. Do you want to download the recipe file? That's a pretty good option. And then a third option, which is the one I usually use, is that Seascape will only download the recipe file when there isn't one that exists on the micro SD card already. That way, I can download the file the very first time and I can start out with that initial CSV file. And then later on, as maybe the program is run on the unit and maybe some parameters are adjusted slightly and saved on the unit itself and that file has become modified a little bit, I won't accidentally overwrite some of the changes that were made to that recipe file that I don't want to. So those are the options you have for making sure this CSV file ends up in the micro SD card. And keep in mind, those are the three options when you have Seascape do it for you. If you want to do it yourself manually with a file copy or something, you can do that as well. All right, we're in the home stretch. So we made sure we have all our process variables created. In my case, I usually start with a spreadsheet and I export that spreadsheet to a CSV file. I go in and we work on the Seascape recipe editor. What's available or what do we do at the very end? Well, at the very end, we've created our recipes, but we need to provide some method to actually loading those recipes at runtime. So that's where we use, or we go into the graphics editor and we'll use the recipe object to build that capability into our screens. Or maybe we'll instead, maybe we'll write some logic utilizing the load recipe function block in our logic, or maybe we'll do a little bit of both. And then once we've completed the process of editing our screens and writing our logic to incorporate whatever recipe functionality we need, then we can go ahead and download our application. So that's the workflow. All right, let's go ahead and show that to you in real time or with an actual demo. And I think that'll be very, very valuable. Let's go ahead and start out in Seascape. Okay, so what I have here is I have an application where I'm going to be doing paint mixing. I thought paint mixing was a good way of kind of uh, demonstrating recipe functionality. So remember the first step in our process is making sure we have our process variables all created and we know which ones those are, how they're scaled and all those sorts of things. In this paint mixing application, I have four process variables that I'm gonna use as quote unquote ingredients. Okay, I have three different dyes that I can use for mixing the different colors. And then I have a mix time variable. So the dye variables are gonna be in percent, you know, zero to 100%. My mix time is gonna be in seconds. So again, I've, I now know what variables that I want to be under recipe control. Okay, the next thing I like to do in my workflow is I like to go ahead and create a worksheet that has my recipes incorporated that I'm gonna start from here. And I'm showing that to you here on the screen. Okay, so what I've got is an Excel spreadsheet where going across the top in rows, these are my ingredients, blue dye, red dye, blue dye, yellow dye, and the mix time. And then going down are the different products that I'm going to be manufacturing while I vary these process variables over here. Okay, and there happen to be six in this case, basically six different paint colors is what I've got for products. Okay, so I created this spreadsheet. The next step would be to export it as a CSV file because Seascape can't handle XLS file or an SL XLSX file directly. It needs a CSV file. And we can go ahead and export that. And I've already done that before the demo today. All right, so I've got my spreadsheet created. Next step is I'm gonna go ahead and enter the recipe editor which is available under the program menu. Here's recipe menu. Now, this is the first time I've come into this menu, so it's automatically asking me for, for me to specify this new recipe. So under recipe name, I'm gonna go ahead and just call it paints. 
Why do you need to name your recipe function? Well, because in a typical application, you might have multiple recipes. Maybe I've got a machine which is mixing paint and then later on it's gonna be applying a finish and maybe doing some curing. I may have one set of recipes for mixing the paint color and another set of recipes for the finishes that I'm gonna to apply to the product. So that's why you need to name the particular recipe that you're gonna work on. Now the file name it's asking for, that is the spreadsheet file name or the CSV file name. And I'm gonna go ahead and just call that paints.csv. And you do need to follow the 8.3 format for your file name here. All right, next, how many products are we gonna have and how many ingredients are we gonna have? Well, in my case, I've got four ingredients, three different dye colors and mixing time. And then I'm gonna go ahead and just have six different products to start. Okay, those are the different paint colors that I'm gonna be mixing. Okay, when I hit okay here, you can see it automatically creates this spreadsheet, all right? Or it looks like a spreadsheet that I can use to work on the recipe spreadsheet file. Now, in my case, since I went ahead and did the work of creating a spreadsheet up front, instead of just manually filling everything in from scratch, I'm gonna go ahead and import in the CSV file that I started with. So I'm gonna go ahead and go to File, Import Data. I'll go ahead and import this Paints CSV file. And as you can see, it automatically filled in the names of all my products and all the values for all my variables. What it didn't do, and this is Seascape 9.9 .9 Service Pack 5, is it did not bring in the names of the different ingredients. Okay, so I'll need to fill those in manually. But that's not a big deal because not only do I need, do they now need a name, but they also need to be tied to a particular variable. Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and do this for you here. So my first ingredient is red dye. So I'll just go ahead, oops, let me get rid of that caps lock here. Red dye. All right, so I've named it. Oh, and I don't need to use an underscore character because this is a just a descriptive string. So it's not a variable or anything. Numeric is fine. I want to tie this to a particular process variable in my program, so I use the tag browser here. I'll select the red dye variable. That's what I want. Okay. I want decimal format. This is a percentage. And I only need three digits. All right. And I do want this to be... This is a selection you'll have to make as a system designer. Do you want these to be editable in the field or not? I'm gonna say yes, and zero to 100 is the range I want. Okay, so now I need to go through and do that for each of my four ingredients. Next, I have blue dye, which is tied to a variable called blue dye, believe it or not. Three digits is all I need to display because it's a percentage. There we go. And I do want it editable from zero to 100. Okay, let's do that one more time with our yellow die. Again, every, every individual ingredient needs to be tied to a process variable. And we wanna configure the process variable in terms of its number of digits, its format, and these are all decimal. And when users are entering in values, we wanna limit the value they can enter in. Now the last one is a little different. Remember, this is my mix time. Okay, and this is still an integer. However, it is a, its engineering units are actually seconds. Okay, so let's make that seconds for engineering units. I'm still gonna keep it as three digits because I'm gonna say that the maximum I'm gonna allow is 10 minutes or 600 seconds here. Okay, so you can tell that's probably the most lengthy process in the whole recipe creation process is, you know, filling in the details there for your ingredients and tying those all individually to a particular process variable. Now, one step that I did a little bit out of order, but let's go ahead and do that now. After we've created our recipe where we named it and we've sized it and we've assigned the file name, one other step that we need to take at some point is to configure our product register. And remember, this is the register that we can use in our logic program and on the screen to monitor what 
particular product recipe has currently been selected. And we can this can either be numeric, which is an index, or it can be the, the ASCII name. I'm gonna go ahead and use name here. I've already created a variable, which is a byte array that's 32 bytes long called paint mix current. I'll select that one, okay, or the first element of that byte array. And we're pretty much done. All right, so that is the settings in the Seascape recipe editor. All right, next we need to make sure that the spreadsheet file gets located onto the micro SD card on the OCS. And there's different ways we can do that. We could just manually take that, that CSV file and copy it over to the memory card. We could do that using the standard, you know, a card reader or something. But we can also allow Seascape to do it for us. And if we have Seascape do it for us, then we're gonna wanna go to the program download options dialog. And down here in this section here, that's where we can decide when do we want Seascape to go ahead and download that spreadsheet file. Now, in my case, I've told you before, I prefer only to do it when there's when the file doesn't exist yet. So when it's the very first time I do the program download, that's typically when I'm going to go ahead and do that. But I have other options as well, as you can see. All right, so we've really completed all the configuration of the recipe function but we need to have a way of loading recipes at runtime, right? And we might do that on the screen, we might do that in logic. So let me show you how I've set up this particular demo. All right, so I'm going to the graphics editor. Let me go ahead and maximize that here. So what I've done here is I've just used standard data objects to display the current value of each of my four ingredients. So these are just standard data objects that I've configured. And they're monitoring individually the variables that I've tied to my ingredients. Okay, so this is not specifically tied to the recipe function. These are just standard data field type objects on the screen here, and I've got them all aligned here. Now over here, this is where I went ahead and configured each of the four different functions for the Seascape recipe object. Although I just fibbed to you a little bit because in reality, this first object here, while I could have configured it as a view option or a view indicator for the Seascape recipe object, which is right here, I could have done that. Instead, I use just a standard ASCII text indicator here because I have a little more control over you know, font size and those sorts of things. So this is just a standard ASCII text data field where I'm monitoring that ASCII variable that I created for the product variable. Okay, remember we had the option of an index or a product name and I went the product name route. And so this is my byte array that contains the string for the product that's been selected. However, the rest of these three are actual recipe object, objects themselves. The first one here, I'm using as a load push button. So how do you configure a load push button for the recipe object? Well, first you have to select which recipe this is tied to, because remember we can have multiple recipes going on, maybe one for mixing paint, maybe one for the finish or the curing, whatever the application calls for. So in this case, I only have one, I selected paints. And then this is where we select what button type we're using it for. And in my case, for this particular button, we're using load. All right. And that's really other than the legend, which is just kind of a common data field for all of these sort of objects. That's really all there is to configuring it. And then the next one we've configured as an edit button and the last one as a save button. And I'll show you how those work when we actually get to the OCS portion of the demo. All right. So I've got all my ingredients shown here on the screen. I went ahead and have my recipe objects for the different buttons configured here. And then I did one other thing. So normally you would use the load function for loading in a new recipe, but you have other options as well. Remember I told you there's a load function block you can use. So to kind of illustrate the load function block a little bit, I also created this quick color selection in my demo. So this, these six push buttons here are just standard momentary push buttons. That's all they are. 
tied each to their own individual bit type variable. And then when those individual bit type variables turn on, they're going to trigger in logic a recipe load function. So let's take a look at that in logic. So I'm gonna exit the graphics editor here, and I'm gonna to go to my select paint logic routine. And here's the one for violet. So this is the bit that turns on when I press that push button uh, and when I want to load violet, uh, the settings for violet paint. And then when that contact is on, the load recipe function block executes, and it's gonna load the, the product violet paint. And it's also got a status register tied to it. So if there's a problem with that, maybe somebody forgot to include the micro SD card or they pulled the micro SD card or something, if there's a problem with that, the status register will tell us that. So for each of the different products, I've got a different load recipe function block that I can use for loading that particular product's parameters. So that's really all I did in this particular demo in terms of utilizing the load recipe function block. All right, next let's go ahead and take a look at this application actually running on the OCS itself. Okay, so here's, here's our application. You can see that currently the recipe that's loaded is violet. And I can utilize this load function button here, this load recipe function button here, to select a different recipe to be loaded. So let me go ahead and select, let me that slate there. Okay, and you should notice the parameters have changed as well as the product variable has changed as well. Okay, so that's the load function or one of the ways that you can load a particular product. Again, when you press that button, you get a pop-up window that comes up with all of your different product recipes that are available to you. Use the arrow keys to select the one you want and then press enter to trigger the load. Couldn't be simpler. However, from a user interface, there's another way we could do it. And that's the way I chose to build on my own using the load recipe function block along with these push buttons. Okay, so I could go ahead and select different recipes using this approach. And keep in mind what's happening is now we've got, when each of these individual buttons is pressed, we're triggering a load recipe function block. Finally, we've got a couple other functions I'll go through here. Let's start with the edit. So let's say that for the slate color, we want to change our mixing time from 103 seconds to 105 seconds. So using this edit function, I first selected the slate paint. Okay, and now I'm gonna go ahead and change my parameter that I wanna tweak. All right, so that's been changed. I can hit exit and exit again. All right, and now let's go ahead and load violet. All right, and then let's load slate again. Yep, and sure enough, we've changed that parameter from 103 to 105 using the edit function or the edit recipe object function. Finally, there's another way we can make adjustments, and that is we could just go ahead in here and change the parameters directly. So let's say we wanna change our time now to um, 100 seconds even. Okay, so I've changed that parameter itself. I could then use a save button. Okay, and how is the save button different? Well, the save button is different in that it takes whatever the values currently are for the different ingredients that are included in that recipe. And then it takes those current values and saves them away to the recipe or to the product, I should say, that you specify. In my case, it's slate. I hit enter. Are you sure you wanna do that? Because remember, we're overwriting the spreadsheet file. Yes, I am. And again, let's switch to a different color and then go back to slate. And we can see, sure enough, that change was permanently made. If we just make a change, for instance, change this to 30 seconds and we don't do a save, all right, then if we switch to a different color and switch back again, you'll see that that 30 seconds didn't permanently take. That was just a temporary change that never impacted the actual recipe itself. Okay, so hopefully uh, that demonstration kind of makes it clear how we can use the recipe function in Seascape to manage an uh, environment in which you're manufacturing multiple process or using a process to manufacture multiple products, for instance. 
I'm gonna go ahead and bring Casey Cardner back in. All right, Casey, so do you think I missed anything? I don't think so, I think covered it pretty well. Terrific, um, I know that every time I work with one of these advanced features like recipes, I end up kind of learning a new, uh, a, a new little tidbit that I can use in my future application. So it's been fun to kind of play with recipes again. I hadn't used them in, a, in quite a while actually. Did we have? Yeah, there was. Go ahead. I was gonna say they're always more advanced than we remember. It seems to me. Absolutely, there was a bit more functionality there than I did remember. That's an excellent point. Did we have any questions today? No questions. We had one comment from Dewalt saying that this was a video he was definitely looking forward to. So terrific. Um, that's about it. One thing I want to mention also is that um, our tech support team from time to time we'll put together tech tips. And these are generally really short little videos that can be really handy. And if you're in a big hurry and you just want a piece of information, you don't need all the depth that we give you on our live streams, uh, you can look for those videos as well. And as luck would have it, a little short four minute quick start video or tech tip video on recipes was just posted a few days ago uh, by our tech support um, engineer, Chuck Robinson. So good job, Chuck, way to get that information up there in yet another format for our users. Okay, thanks Casey. Uh, and again, if you're watching this on replay, we still want your questions, just get them to us in the comment section and we'll get them answered. Okay, let me remind you, we're here every Tuesday at two o'clock Eastern time with another live stream, with another technical topic. We hope you find these interesting. And of course, you can always watch them live where you can ask questions live or make comments live if you wish, or you can also watch them on replay and then we'll get your questions answered in non real time. Next week, this should be fun. So recipes is a great feature as you can see, but we've made even some additional improvements and enhancements to the recipe feature in Seascape 10. So part two of our series is really gonna be all about previewing the new recipe feature in Seascape 10. It builds upon all the things we showed you today, but adds a lot of really handy user interface enhancements. We think you're gonna find it's terrific. Now, if you haven't done so already, don't forget to subscribe. It doesn't cost anything. If you choose to subscribe to our channel and you also select the notifications bell, you'll get a notification every time we go live or every time we post a new video like Chuck Robinson did this week. All right, once again, it is the Christmas series in, or season in which we are recording this particular live stream and I want to wish you and yours a very Merry Christmas.